Good morning and thank you for joining us for our Sunday morning service. This is a live streaming from Cornerstone Baptist Church, Tregear, New South Wales. Our hope is that through the scriptures, we would grow in grace and the knowledge of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, that we would share the gospel message with the lost and that you would be challenged, encouraged, comforted and exhorted through the preaching of the Word of God. If you have any questions, please visit our website, www.cornerstonebaptistchurch.com.au. And now, a message from our pastor, Philip Gaddis. I hope you've had a good Lord's Day today, uh, worshiping the Lord, fellowshipping with one another, resting, sleeping, eating, and all those types of things that we normally would do on a Sunday. Now, uh, tonight, what we're going to be doing, we're going to look at the book of 1 Corinthians, please. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. Now, for those of you that's been with us and been following and uh, the last few weeks, we've talked about the local church. We've been talking about the local church, and today is part number 12, local church part number 12, and we're going to talk about how to handle a matter against another brother within the church. How to handle a matter with another brother when you have a matter against another brother within the church, and that's going to come from 1 Corinthians chapter Number six, 1 Corinthians chapter number six. And before we get started, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer, ask him to be with us. So let's pray. Father, we pray that you'll be with us tonight. Teach us out of the word of God. And Lord, speak to our hearts. And Lord, I pray that you'll teach us out of the Bible and we might learn how to be better Christians for the glory of God and for your honor and for Jesus Christ's sake. And for it's in his name we pray it. Amen and amen. Now, as I said, we've been teaching on the local church. Last time, we looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Now, in that chapter, we saw that when someone is sinning certain sins, like committing fornication, covetousness, idolatry, railing, drunkenness, and extortion, and they're going around bragging on it. They have no repentance about it. They have no uh, shame about it. They're not... Uh, they're not, ups they're not upset that they've sinned they've messed up instead they're bragging they're they're posting it on facebook instagram and twitter and they're just bragging about this sin and let everybody know about it and they refuse to get right we said from 1 corinthians 5 that the church must react to these things we said we should be sad about it we should not be making a joke about their sin we should not be um uh, laughing about it we should be sad about it we say we should deal with it and that dealing with it means we got to separate from the erring brother who refuses to get right we said the Bible teaches that we are to separate that there's a brother there's a man who claims to be a brother and he's committing fornication he's covetous he's an idolater he's railer he's drunkard and he's extortioner and he's bragging about his sin and he refused to get right. We are to separate from that brother. And the reason why we're to do that is to prove to that erring brother that it's not acceptable what he's doing. We also said it's also to place that erring brother in a position where they can see that sin does not pay. Sin does not pay. And it's to protect that erring brother from something worse happening. If we will deal with sin, uh, it, will, it will allow God to work and God to move and to keep certain things from happening because then that brother might get right. But if we pamper somebody that's in sin, if we uh, just turn a, a blind eye to somebody that's in sin and we refuse to deal with it, we're actually showing our lack of love for that brother and also our lack of love for God. And so we said if we're going to uh, uh, be the Christian we ought to be, we need to deal with sin. We need to separate from those that are, that are erring. 
and not count them as an enemy, but to admonish them as a brother. And this pleases the Lord, and this helps us to be able to participate in that feast of joy the Lord has for us. Now, today, I want to go on to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And again, as I said, I want to speak to you on how to handle a matter when, that, when you have a matter against another brother or sister within the fold. And the first thing I'd like to look at is found in verse number 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 1. The Bible says this, Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? The first thing I'd like you to see before we get any further is this. He says, Dare any of you having a matter against another, we are going to have matters against one another from time to time. We are not perfect. We all make mistakes. We all annoy somebody. We all get on somebody's nerves from time to time. We all uh, 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 cause somebody to get upset. We all hurt somebody. We are not perfect. None of us are perfect. And as such, we will sometime or another offend somebody or somebody will offend us. That is a fact. Some people think, well, if I'm in the, if I'm in, I got the right spouse and I'll never have a fight. Who are you kidding? You've been, you've been reading too many fairy tale books. You've been reading too many uh, uh, novels written by people that don't tell you the truth. Some of you think, well, if I, because I'm telling you something, if you got, if you even had the right spouse, the God given spouse, you are going to have issues from time to time. Amen, amen, and amen. And so get ready. <laughs> now, when that happens, now it happens. It's trying to help you here for a minute because it's the thing that he's saying. Paul is saying here, dare, how dare any of you go to law against uh, one another, against the unjust, when you have a problem against one another? He is, he is already knowing that we're going to have problems against one another from time to time. Inside of marriages, you're going to have trouble. Inside of churches, you're going to have trouble. We're going to have trouble from time to time. We come to church. I mean, right now we are, uh, uh, we're not able to meet in person. And so, uh, but I can guarantee you, if you call enough, or there'll be somebody out there probably thinking, well, nobody's called me. Nobody's checked on me. Uh, and there's going to be somebody who's going to be offended. <laughs> Out there, because and and maybe rightfully so, and maybe you haven't called anybody. Maybe you've been so self-centered and so that you've not had a chance to talk, call anybody. Who knows? I don't know, but we get offended easily, and so we're going to have trouble because we're not perfect. Now, when trouble comes your way, young couple, when trouble comes your way, church member, what are you supposed to do? I'll tell you what you're not supposed to do. You are not to turn tail and run. <laughs> When, when, you, when, when, when all of a sudden there's traumas in the church, all of a sudden there's troubles, somebody's offended you. Somebody didn't shake your hand. Somebody didn't look at you and, and say hello to you. Somebody didn't call you. Somebody didn't text you. Hey, somebody was having a gathering and you didn't know about it until it was all over. Hey, you know what? You don't run. You don't say, well, I'm offended. I'm leaving to go find somewhere where I fit in. You don't turn tail and run. Uh, you're, you're married and you say, well, she's not the woman I thought she was. Well, he's not the man. I thought he was a gentleman, but now I've lived with him and I realize he's not a gentleman. He's actually a little bit rude from time to time. Throws his stuff on the floor, won't even pick it up. You don't turn tail and run because of something like that. Yes, that's how you handle it. It doesn't also, I'll tell you something else. It does not mean you're not in the will of God if you have trouble. If you have ought against a brother, if you have a matter against another, it doesn't mean you're supposed to turn tail and run. It doesn't mean you're not in the will of God. Some people think, well, I married the wrong one because they had a fight. And they think, well, Christians aren't supposed to get arguments. And, and therefore, and, and they're not. You're not supposed to argue, but unfortunately we do argue. And you're not supposed to get upset with one another. And well, you probably shouldn't, but you do. Uh, we're not supposed to, whatever's the case, say, well, I must not be in the will of God. Or a man may go to the mission field or, or go and do a work of God and some, or go to do something for the Lord. And on his way to do something for the Lord, he has a flat tire. Oh, God must have not have been in this. 
No, it doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that at all. Or you get sick. Well, God must be telling me that it's, that it's not God's will. No, you just got sick. You live in the world. You just had a flat tire. You had an argument with your spouse. You had an argument with somebody in the church. You know what it means? It means you're human. It means you're not Jesus Christ yet. <laughs> if any man have a matter against another, the first thing you need to understand is this, is that you're going to have a matter against another from time to time. People think that they have the right spouse, they're not going to fight. That's not true. People think that if they are feeling a bit uncomfortable in a church, that, that must mean they're not in the right place and they need to leave. I just don't feel comfortable there. Nobody likes me and, and, and nobody comes to talk to me. I can't seem to talk to anybody. I must not be in the right church. Who told you that? <laughs> no one told you that. That's, 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 that, that's not from the Lord, rather. The Lord didn't tell you that. Listen, we all feel uncomfortable from time to time. We all get upset from time to time. We all get a matter against another. Some people think that, that uh, if they start a ministry, and they think if something starts going a bit all, that they must not be in the will of God. Again, that's not in the Word of God. You read the Word of God, the book of Acts. You read about Paul the Apostle and, and Peter and all those guys and Stephen. I mean, Stephen's right in the middle of the will of God. Stands up and begins to preach. And as he's beginning to preach, the people get angry at him. And they begin to gnaw on, on him, the Bible says. They begin to get angry with him and they stone him to death. He must not be in the will of God. That kind of thinking. No, he was right in the perfect will of God. As he looked up and saw the Lord standing on the right hand. He was in the perfect will of God. So just because you have dramas doesn't mean you're not in the will of God. So I want to tell you the first point is this. You're going to have issues. You're going to have ought against a brother. Jesus himself said in the world ye shall have tribulation. Just because you and your spouse fight does not mean you need to run. Just because your parents have intense moments, young people, does not mean that you should run. Just because you have a problem with someone at the church does not mean you should run. No, 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 stick in there, stick it out, stay faithful, and handle your problem in a Christian way. Amen and amen. Stay by the stuff. You don't leave your spouse because you had drama, you had a fight. You don't leave a church because you have a matter against another brother or sister. You don't do that. Paul said, he didn't say, now if you have a matter against a brother, make sure you, make sure you just leave, each, leave that church. You're not supposed to be there. He didn't tell that Corinthian church that. He didn't say, now, now stay away from that church then. It's no good. You, that, that man that you had a fight with last night uh, because he didn't, uh, he didn't say thank you. You need to leave him. He's no good. That guy that won't take you out on a date. He's not romantic. I mean, he's just, he's just Mr. Faithful, if you will. But at the same time, he never shows you to titch him. You married him. Don't run and leave him to find Romeo that's trying to be Romeo with all the other girls. <laughs> Amen. That young lady that uh, uh, maybe you thought was one way, turns out to be another way. Don't leave him. Stick in there. Stay faithful. Stay faithful. Now, how are we to handle problems inside of the church where we have a matter against another? Well, look at this in verse number one. Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? He says, how, what he's saying is, I'll, I'll put it in common vernacular. How dare you go to the unjust? That's what he's saying. How dare you do that? He's angry. He's upset. He's frustrated. He's thinking, are you kidding me? You mean to tell me you went to divorce court? Are you kidding me? You took them to the council? Are you kidding me? You got on Facebook and ran them down? Are you kidding me? You got on Twitter? Instagram, and you just told everybody about everything they'd done. How dare you go to the unjust, he's saying. 
We should not go to the world to get them to judge. We are the church of God. We are, we are the ones who God has chosen to judge the angels, he says. Look at verse 2. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? If the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matter? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed the church. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. But brother goeth to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. Now therefore... There is utterly a fault among you because you go to law one with another. Why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Now you do wrong and defraud and that's your brethren. So they were going to law literally uh, going to uh, the judges of the world taking their brother or their sister to law into the common judgment hall and, and, they, and I don't know... Uh, um, uh, it's kind of like back in those days, it'd be sort of like going to Judge Judy. Everybody's watching it. And all the unbelievers are hearing it. About these two Christians fighting each other. This one has, is, is angry because of, cause he wouldn't say hello. This one's angry because he wouldn't, uh, whatever is the case, I don't know. They're going to the world and trying to get the world to judge their brother or their sister. They're airing their dirty laundry of the church out on the world's hills hoist, the world's clothesline. That's what they're doing. It's kind of like today, people putting other people's sins of other brothers or other sisters on the Instagram or the Facebook. Say, look what he did. Or, or so let me send a text out. Oh, he did this. You're going to the world. You're airing the, the, the dirty laundry of the church to the world. Shame on you, he says. You got a problem with the church? You don't go say, well, this church is this. This church is that. This church is this. Shame on you. You don't do that. You got a problem with a brother or a sister. You don't go to the, you don't go and say, hey, they did this to me. They did that to me. That's like you got a problem with your wife or your husband. You don't go telling all your family about their wickedness and their badness and things of that nature. Because I'll tell you why. You may forgive them one day, but your family have a hard time doing it. Shame, shame, shame. Now, you know why we should not do that? Why we shouldn't do that? We shouldn't want others wanting to take our side. The reason why people get on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter and all that kind of stuff, I don't even know what all they got now, but, but irregardless, you know why they get on that stuff and start telling everybody sin? Say so had a problem with the brother at the church. They get on there and they leave a church. They get on there. They did this. They did that. You want people to take your side. That's what that is. You're trying to get people to take your side. And that's not right. How about the Lord's side? How about God's side? Many do not understand the magnitude of the damage done by gossiping and going to the world to run down another brother. You have a problem with the church. People sometimes have a problem with the church, a problem with another brother or sister in the church. They'll go to the job site. Yeah, I was at church the other day, and, and this bloke, and what's your problem? <laughs> you think that bloke's going to want to come to church? <laughs> think he's going to want to be around Christians? <laughs> Wait, these, these people are just, they're just rude, and they're, they're judgmental on me, and every, hey, keep that to yourself. Between you and God, go to God about that. <laughs> You don't go telling the world about your problems. There's no telling how many children have walked away from the faith due to parents running down the church to them. Pastors and, or maybe uh, uh, church members that go home, the pastors this way or, or the church members this way and running down the other, hey, how dare you do that? How dare you do that? 
These poor little children hearing this stuff. Shame, shame, shame. Brothers and sisters, you are not to go and broadcast the problems of your brother or your sister. Dare any of you having a matter against one against another? <laughs> and go to law before the unjust, those that don't know true judgment, and not before the saints? How dare you do that? You, you shouldn't do that. That's what he's saying. You need to learn to cover your brother or your sister's transgression. The Bible does tell us that love covers a multitude of sins. And the Bible does tell us, Jesus Christ said this, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. What's he say? If ye have love one toward another. And what's love? Love covers sins. It doesn't go on Facebook and say, Joe Blow, he, he did this the other day. Hey, this one's done this to me. He, went and, he didn't invite me to his gathering. Can you believe that brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so? Man, quit being a big baby. For the cause of Christ. Amen. That's what he's saying here. Use number one to stop going to the world broadcasting your dirty, the dirty laundry of the church. Showing them what's going on. You shouldn't be gossiping. Gossip is the most, one of the, one of the most terrible sins you can have. Matter of fact, the Bible says that these six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination, a proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, feet that run to mischief, and he goes on and he says, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. Matter of fact, in the book of Romans, chapter 16, the people often say, you're to mark them, mark those people. Here's what it says, which calls divisions. That's what it says. And who's the one causing division? It's those, not li those that are living contrary to the doctrine which you have been taught. And the doctrine tells you, you don't go around gossiping. <laughs> you don't know who you need to mark. Mark the one that gets on the Facebook. Unfriend them. Martin, the guy gets on the Facebook running down your, your mate, running down your church members, running down uh, other brothers and sisters in the church. Unfriend those people. <laughs> Amen. Till they realize they got to get it right. Uh, I say unfriend them. I don't know much about Facebook, but I know that that's one thing that you want to know. Nobody wants to be unfriended. That's all I know. Everybody wants more friends. Don't, don't, don't listen to that rubbish. Amen, amen, and amen. Stop going to the world. You know what the world does? The world reads all that stuff. These Christians, they're shooting each other. They're killing. Look, they're no good. They're all a bunch of hypocrites. And it messes up the work of God. And it turns people that are trying to follow God away from God. So he says, stop going to the world and they're at the dirty laundries. If you got a problem... Here's how you handle it. We've already talked about this before, but I want to show you something else, some, uh, some other things later, but I'll tell you this real quickly. Jesus told you how you handle it. Matthew 18. You know what you do? You go to that brother face to face. You go to that brother face to face. Not text to text. <laughs> not email to email. Face to face. Not phone call to phone call. Face to face. That's what the Bible says. You go to them face to face. Don't hide behind the phone. Don't hide behind the computer. Don't hide behind somebody else. You go to that person face to face. And if they will hear you, you gain your brother. If they not hear you, you go and take somebody else with you. And then you talk to them. If they will not hear you, then you go and you take that to the church. And then the church is to deal with that matter. But we're not to go and air that dirty laundry to the world. Think about David. When Saul, Saul was, was killed, this man took the crown off of Saul and he took it to David, supposing he would be rewarded. See, here, he, 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 this man that did you wrong, David, he, he's, he, he's, he was a bad king. And, and now look at here. David says, 
How did he die? Tell me how he died. And that man begins to tell King, I keep tell David about how that he basically finished off Saul. <laughs> he finished him off. And, and, and the response that David responded with was not the response that this man expected. David did not rejoice. David did not get excited. David did not say, well, that's a blessing. He finally got what was coming to him. It's a blessing. His sin finally found him out. It's a he didn't say any of those things. He began to weep. He began to cry. And he began to say, publish it not. Don't tell anybody what took place. Don't let anybody, don't let the Philistines know about this, lest our God be more. Don't let them know about this. And you, my friend, you thought you'd get rewarded. You did wrong. How dare you touch the Lord's anointing? How dare you go out and face, uh, paste on Facebook those things that you're pasting? That's what he's saying. To put it up to common day, how dare you assassinate another person's character? How dare you run another brother or sister in the church there? How dare you try to divide the church into different camps? How dare you do these things? That's not the right way to do it. You don't go and publish it. You, number one, stop going to the world. You, if you have to, you, you deal with it face to face. And you go with another brother. They don't hear you then. And then you take it to the church. The church deals with it. But you don't go airing your problem out to everybody and letting them know. You don't do that. Next thing, verse number 7. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, look at verse number 7. How do we handle a problem, a matter against a brother? Well, number one, stop going to the world and broadcasting the dirty laundry of the church. Because as you, every time you do, you are helping the devil to give the, give the church a black eye. That's what you're doing. Number two, you share, it with the, share the issue with the church if you have to. But number three, look at verse number 7. Now, therefore, there is utterly a fault among you. He said, you've got a problem, he says. He says, number one, he says, how dare you go to the world? And then number two, you've got a problem. Verse seven, now, therefore, there is utterly a fault among you because you go to law one with another. Here's their problem right here. Why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? You guys know what he's saying? He's saying, why don't you suffer wrong? Why don't you turn the other cheek? He is preaching the same thing that Jesus Christ preached in that great sermon on the mount. That greatest sermon ever to be preached. Jesus Christ said, turn the other cheek. If a man sows you, uh, 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 sorry, if a man sues you at the law, give him your cloak also. Say, so here you go, you can have my cloak. If he asks you to go a mile, go with him twain. He's saying, why don't you suffer reproach? Why don't you stop fighting for your rights and suffer the wrong? That's what he's saying. Well, I deserve to be treated better. Did Jesus deserve to be treated better? Did he? You know he did. But he suffered wrong for the cause of, for the, cause of the Father. Stop getting so upset over petty things and suffer the wrong. What does it matter if someone didn't speak to you? What does it matter if someone did not invite you to their party? Of course, it doesn't matter now. We're all in lockdown now. And none of you can go to a party. But once we're out of lockdown, I'm sure there's going to be some gatherings going on. Hey, listen, if you don't get an invitation, so what? <laughs> what does that matter? What does it matter if someone called you a name? What does it matter if somebody laughed at you? What does it matter if someone does not agree with you on every little pet doctrine you have? Over little pet doctrines. What does it matter if someone celebrates different holidays that you don't believe they should celebrate? Paul says, how dare you? How dare you? Why don't you suffer wrong? I wonder, I wonder how many church splits could have been avoided if people would have suffered wrong. You learn to suffer wrong. We need to walk as our Savior walked, who being reviled, 
reviled not again. That's how Jesus handled it. Who being swore at and cursed at, blessed. Does he not tell us to bless those that curse us? Does he not tell us to do good to those that despitefully use us? But no, we've got our rights. May God help us to stop getting so upset over silly little things that people are doing when there are people that are dying and going to hell all around us. The church is destroying itself over petty problems. Look at the book of 1 Peter with me. 1 Peter chapter 2. I'll show you how we're supposed to handle this thing. Look at 1 Peter with me. One, keep your finger in 1 King, 1 Chronicles, so, sorry, 1 Corinthians. Keep your finger in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and go to 1 Peter with me. 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. And I'll read you what the Bible says. What the Bible says that the Christian's supposed to be like. 1 Peter chapter number 2, verse number 13. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 13. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme, or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of them that do well. And that's why we obey lockdown orders. Because the Bible says to obey those that have the rule over us. Verse 15. For, for so is the will of God, that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. So what's happening here, he's telling them you need to obey the governors, obey the, the government that's over you. He says that way you can put to silence those, the ignorance of silly men that are all the time trying to point to Christians as rebels and things of that nature. You need to obey. And he says then, he says, don't you be like some people who want to use their liberty in Christ as a cloak of their maliciousness, of being just a bunch of rebels wanting to rebel. I got liberty in Christ. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. Don't you use that, that mindset. He says, don't do that. And he goes on, verse 17. Honor all men. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear. Not only to the good and gentle, look what he says, but also to the forward. For this is thankworthy. If a man for conscience toward God, now look what he says, endure grief, suffering wrongly. For what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently. But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently. This is acceptable with God. He's saying when you do right and you suffer, but you take it patiently, now you're doing like a Christian, he says. And when someone gets on to you for doing wrong, of course you should take it. But there's sometimes when you're doing right, you need to learn to take that patiently. Hey, there's going to be somebody offend you. Somebody in the church is going to offend you. You don't run. You don't run them down. You take it patiently like a Christian. Look at what he says in verse number 21. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his step, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again, when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye, uh, ye were healed, for ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. What he's simply saying there is simply this. Listen, think about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was reviled, he was mocked, he was ridiculed, he was laughed at, and instead of blasting people, he loved people, he continued to show love, he put up with it. Why did he do that? For the sake of me and you that we might be saved. In other words, on that cross, he could have come down from that cross and set everyone on straight. But instead, he put up with it because he saw in the future people were going to get saved. How come you, how you and I are supposed to put up with some of this stuff so that people can be saved? You've got to put up with somebody offending you from time to time. 
So that you can go forward for the cause of Christ. So that people can get saved. You don't quit on God, quit on the church because something, somebody talked about you. You can't do that. I wonder how many missionaries could have stayed on the field had the church suffered wrong, had somebody suffered wrong. I wonder how many missionaries would have stayed on the field and worked together with other missionaries had they been willing to suffer wrong when another missionary did them wrong. I wonder how many spouses would have stayed together had they suffered wrong instead of always fighting for their rights. I wonder how many saints would have kept their joy if they just would have suffered wrong like Jesus Christ and Paul the Apostle. My brothers and sisters, we are to endure hardness as a good soldier, but we are not to become hardened. We are not to be so soft that we get so easily offended. We need to grow some skin. We need to harden up a bit, if you will, when it comes to getting offended so easily. Be soft and tender toward people and toward others, but don't be so soft and tender toward yourself of being upset. Oh, they talked, they didn't invite me. Man, how can we get like that? Say people ought to have some backbone, some inner fortitude, some inner resolve, and be firm and earnestly contend for the faith and just be men and women of God. How do you handle an issue when you got ought against a brother? Number one, stop running your mouth on social media. Stop going to the unjust, letting them know about it. Stop texting everybody. Stop gossiping to everybody. Go to them face to face. Take with you a brother if you need to. Then take it to the church. But we dare not let the world know about all the problems. And then, I say to you, most of the time though, you need to learn to just suffer wrong. And then the next thing, look at verse number 9, 1 Corinthians 6, verse number 9. 1 Corinthians 6, verse number 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall, actually look at verse 8, sorry. Nay, he says, you're supposed to suffer wrong, but verse 8, nay, you do wrong and defraud. And that's your brethren. You're defrauding your brother. He says, you're doing wrong. He says, you should be willing to be defrauded, but instead, you're doing wrong and you're defrauded. In other words, it'd be like this. So, you know, inside, of, I've seen it happen in churches before. Uh, instead, of, instead of taking the wrong and being willing to be defrauded, suffer the wrong, instead, uh, you want to defraud your brother, your friendship, your handshake, your smile, your how are you doing today, your courtesy. You defraud him, just common gentleness, just being a calm, just, just acting like he's somebody or she's somebody. Instead, you treat them like a dog. You defraud them this simple things. You do wrong on that. It's not right. You cut them off. You do wrong on that. It's not right. Not over some of these little things that we do sometimes. So we're talking, talking about little things here. Then he says over here in verse number 8, Nay, you do wrong and defraud, and that's your brethren. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves of mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. How are you supposed to handle a matter when you got a matter against another brother? Number one, hey, listen, you need to be willing to uh, understand that we're all human and stop going to the world about, your, about, our, about the issues and deal with it in the Christian way, according to Matthew chapter 18. Suffer wrong if you have to. And I want to say this, stop acting like the world. Stop acting like you used to act and start acting like a Christian. Quit Try not to offend people. 
He says, you were a deceiver. You were a fornicator. Some of you were idolaters. That means you were all full of yourself, worship yourself. Some of you were adulterers. Some of you were feminists. Some of you were abusive mankind. Some of you were thieves. Some of you were covetous. Some of you were drunkards. Some of you were revilers. Some of you were extortioners. Hey, but you're not that way now. Act like a Christian. Start acting like a Christian. Quit acting like the world. That's what he's saying to him. He said, then quit acting like it used to be. You're no longer that way anymore. Hey, you no longer... When you got saved, you got born again. That word effeminate again is one of those where he's talking about being soft. Before you got saved, oh, you're all the time running people down. You're all the time uh, talking about people, spreading the gossip. You're all the time uh, part of the crowd. Oh, let me tell you a story. Oh, let me hear it. But once you got saved, you're no longer that way. You're saved. You're born again. You're justified. You're a child of God. Start acting like a Christian. Amen. That's what he's telling them in this passage. And then there's actually, we could keep on going on those things. He, he actually tells them to start flee fornication. He tells them all different things. He says, no, you're not. It's your body, the temple of God. Hey, listen, you're a child of God. He's saying, quit acting like the world. That's what he's telling them. You read the rest of the chapter, that's what he's telling them. But verses 9 and 11 actually can be taken a few, few different ways. And it can be taken like this. <coughs> He just got to tell them, hey, learn to suffer wrong. And then he reminds them, hey, don't you remember who you were? Don't you remember that you were a deceiver? You're thinking about that guy that deceived you, and you're thinking, man, I'm going to tell everybody he's a deceiver. And he says, hey, well, wait a minute. Don't you remember that you also were a deceiver at one time, that you also were a fornicator at one time? Don't you remember that also you were an idolater and you were an adulterer? Don't you remember these things how you used to be? And yet, he says in verse number 11, and such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are just by the name of the Lord and by the Spirit of God. What he's saying to you is this in this passage. This is one way it can be read. Hey, listen, God sure did forgive you of a lot, didn't he? Didn't God forgive you of all that wicked stuff you did? And you used to be this way. You remember how you used to be? And yet God washed you. God cleaned you. Hey, listen. He sure has forgiven you a lot. Can't you forgive a little? That's what he's saying to him, basically. That's one way you can read this passage. One way you can read this passage is simply this. Hey, listen, you're defrauding your brother and you're not suffering wrong, but you're defrauding him. Hey, don't you know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? And such were some of you. But you got washed. Don't you remember what God did for you? Don't you remember what he did for you? He forgave you so much that some people don't even know all the wickedness you've done. And thank God that the world doesn't know all the wickedness that we've done. Thank God that none of you know what everybody wickedly has done. Your brother, your sister. If we all knew everything you did, all did, knew everything I did, man, we wouldn't probably talk to each other, look at each other. But God has forgiven us. And he's saying, if God has forgiven you of so much, can't you forgive a little? Doesn't the Lord tell us that we are to forgive even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven us? I mean, God's forgiven you of being an adulterer. Can't you forgive somebody because they called you a name? God's forgiven some of you for being a fornicator. Can't you forgive somebody because they didn't call you and check on you? God's forgiven some of you for being drunkards. Can't you forgive somebody because uh, they, didn't, they, they didn't friend you? Why do you got to be so angry with people? God's forgiven you of all these wicked things that you used to do. And somebody simply maybe doesn't pour you the right kind of... Maybe they, don't, maybe they give everybody else a drink, but they don't give you a drink. Maybe they have a gathering and they invite everybody, but not you. And you know they're pointing you out. You know that they're purposely not inviting you. Maybe, maybe at least you think they are. And you're telling me, when you think about what God forgave you of, you can't forgive that brother or that sister and just go on about it? Think about what God's done for you. That's one way you can read that. Another way you can read that is 
Seems like I said a while ago, you were a fornicator, you were an idolater, you were all these wicked things, but now you're saved. Act like it. Don't handle your problem the same way other people handle their problems. The world goes and gossips about other people. The world goes and, and tells on Facebook all the wicked things that somebody did at their work that they don't like. They want to run them down. The world texts and talks about people inside the workplace or in their schoolhouse or at the school that they don't like. Christians aren't supposed to do that. We're on the same team. <laughs> we got the same father, the same family. You used to be this way. Don't act like that anymore. You belong to Christ. Deal with issues like a man or a woman of God and go to the Lord. You belong to him anyway. You're justified in the name of Jesus by the spirit of our God. Now, let's look at verse number 12. Look at verse number 12. And that body needs you. That local church, wherever you live, wherever you're at, they need you. They need your help. Get involved. Get in. And learn to put up with some things. It'll help you. You might realize people have to put up with you from time to time too, by the way. And it'll bless your church. And it'll bless the work of God. And it'll bring glory to Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ gets glory in the church. Now with that said, let's go Lord in prayer. And We'll be back again on Wednesday at 7 o'clock doing the book of Colossians verse by verse. I hope you come back for that. Thank you for joining us again. You have been listening to preaching from Pastor Philip Gaddis, a ministry of Cornerstone Baptist Church, Tregear, New South Wales. Our prayer and hope is that God spoke to you through the preaching and through the scriptures today. We encourage you to go on for the Lord and to serve Him as best you can. For more messages like this, please visit our website www.cornerstonebaptistchurch.com.au or visit our YouTube channel, Cornerstone Baptist Church, Sydney West. On behalf of the Cornerstone family, may the Lord keep you safe and we hope to see you again.